So welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. And turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 30 this evening. Now if you remember, if you've been watching online, so we'll see if you remember, the theme of the Gospel of Mark is Jesus Christ, God's servant. And the key verse in the Gospel of Mark is Mark 10.45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And the key word found throughout the Gospel of Mark is the word immediately. The Gospel of Mark was written for a Roman audience that valued action over words. And so Mark is a very fast-paced Gospel account with the actions of Jesus recorded primarily. And so the key word that we see again and again is this, this word of action, this word of immediacy. Now this chapter, chapter 6, is the second longest chapter in the Gospel of Mark. And, and it marks the middle and, and it marks the high point of Jesus' ministry. At this point in his ministry, Jesus is immensely popular. But we also find in this section, starting in, in chapter 6, we find a lot of unbelief. People who should have believed turned away from Jesus in unbelief. Now in this chapter, Jesus also gave his 12 disciples, whom he named apostles, power. And he sent them out to preach. He sent them out to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And it was a lesson of faith, as they were to take nothing with them for their journey. Jesus said to them before sending them out in verses 8 and 9, he said to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. They were sent out by Jesus to do the work of Jesus, and they were, were required to live by the faith of Jesus along the way. And it sort of was a practice run for when Jesus was no longer with them. Now while the apostles are out, ministering in Jesus' name, we have this, this interlude, this break in the story. Jesus' fame, you see, had come to the attention of King Herod, that is, Herod Antipas. And he, again, is one of those people that should have believed, but he didn't. He's an example of unbelief in this chapter. In verses 14 through 29 of chapter 6, we have the account of, of King Herod and the, and the martyrdom of John the Baptist. Herod had John the Baptist beheaded after being tricked by his wife Herodias by using her daughter to bait the old and lustful king. Herodias' daughter, whom the historian Josephus tells us her name was Salome, danced before the king on his birthday and excited the king so much that he promised to give her anything she wanted up to half his kingdom. She went back to her mother and asked her mother, what should I ask for? And her reply was the head of John the Baptist. Now after this break in the story and ministry of Jesus, the disciples now return from being sent out. And it's here that we pick up the story uh, in chapter 6, starting in verses 30 and 31. Look with me there. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Now back in verses 7 through 13 of this chapter, Jesus sent out the twelve disciples, whom he named apostles, to, uh, to, that, to preach that the people should repent, to cast out demons, and to anoint with oil many who were sick, and, and to heal them. 
And it doesn't say how long they were on this mission, but here they have returned. And, and what we see here in, this, in these few verses is that Jesus has compassion even on those who were serving. First thing the apostles did when they returned was go and tell Jesus what they had done and what they had taught. They were so excited, no doubt. They were out there preaching repentance and casting out demons and, and anointing with oil and healing the sick. Man, first thing I'd want to do when I got back is tell somebody, man, you got to see what, what we did, what the Lord did through us. It's amazing. Which, could you believe having done that? Man, you'd, you'd want to be telling everybody you knew what you'd done. Well, they wanted to come back and tell Jesus. They said they, uh, they, they told him what they had done and what they had taught. And Jesus recognized that they needed a rest. Can you imagine how busy you would be today if you could heal anyone sick with COVID-19? <laughs> Could you imagine the, the line outside your door if you could do that? They'd been sent out by Jesus. They'd faithfully served Jesus. And now Jesus recognizes their need for a break. In fact, since they'd returned, ministry was still so busy that they did not even have time to eat. That's busy in ministry. So they get into a boat. And they cross from the western shore of the Sea of Galilee to the eastern shore to a, a deserted area that we're told in Luke chapter 9 verse 10 belonged to the city of Bethsaida. In verse 32 it says, So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. So they leave the multitude behind and they cross over the Sea of Galilee to the eastern shore, to an area that I mentioned was owned by the city of uh, Bethsaida, which was on the western shore, not the eastern shore, but apparently they owned this property on the other side of the sea. And it was an area that was not inhabited. It was a deserted place. There, they were out in the open. There weren't any villages or cities uh, close by, or at least they weren't in a village or city. In verse 33 it says, But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine that scene? Jesus and his apostles are trying to get away for some much needed rest and relaxation. So they take a boat across the Sea of Galilee by themselves. But the multitude, and that's a whole lot of people, <laughs> but the multitude saw them departing and outran them to the other side of the sea, a sea that is about 12 miles long and 8 miles wide. It's likely they had to run 10 or 12 miles to get around the sea to the other side. In fact, they beat Jesus and the apostles there. What a scene that must have been. Could you imagine it? You're rowing, you're rowing across the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> and, and, and at the edge of the sea, all you can see is this cloud of dust. And it's moving. And it's going. And it's rounding the top of the lake. And you're rowing. And, and every once in a while, you can get a glimpse of some people in the midst of that cloud. <laughs> It's like, a, it's like a, a human stampede around the lake. It says in verse 34, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Instead of being annoyed at the crowd, Instead of being angry at being interrupted, instead of being disappointed in not getting some rest, Jesus was moved with compassion for the crowd who had run all the way around the sea to see him. Isn't that great to know that Jesus sees our need for him and it moves him to compassion. He's not annoyed by you. 
when you knock on his door and you knock again and you knock again and you chase the Lord down around the sea, the Lord's not annoyed at you. He's moved with compassion. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And so, what does he do? He shepherds them. He began to teach them many things. This was and, and this is the most pressing need in anyone's life to learn from God, to hear God's word. It's this spiritual need that is the greatest need of mankind. Many churches have this backwards today. They meet all of the material needs, but they neglect the spiritual needs. But if the spiritual needs are neglected, then men and women will be lost for all eternity, having had their bellies filled, but their spirits empty. So Jesus began, first and foremost, to teach them many things. Look at verses 35 and 36. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is late. Uh, or, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Both the apostles and Jesus see the same problem. It's late in the day. They are out in a deserted place, and everyone is in need of some food. The disciples suggest that Jesus send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country, villages, and, and buy themselves some bread. But Jesus has other plans, plans that involve faith, plans that involve a lesson for the apostles. In verse 37 it says, But he, that's Jesus, answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? <laughs> no doubt the apostles were startled by Jesus' statement. You give them something to eat. Where were they going to get all that food? It was late in the day. There were over 5,000 men to feed, we're told, besides women and children. And a year's wages, 200 denarii, would be needed just to make one meal. Now the apostles had just returned, as I mentioned earlier, from their miracle tour. They took nothing with them. Jesus supplied all their needs miraculously. They healed the sick in Jesus' name, and they cast out demons in Jesus' name. They should have expected the miraculous, but they didn't. They were looking only at the physical possibilities and they couldn't see with eyes of faith. And not only couldn't they see with eyes of faith, we're going to learn later that they didn't want to see with eyes of faith because their hearts were hardened because unlike Jesus, who had compassion on the multitude, they were annoyed that they were interrupted. They were annoyed that their rest was taken away. And we'll see that later in the text. You know, the, uh, the story, is one of many, is told of George Mueller. How many of you know who George Mueller is? Famous English Christian evangelist who ran orphanages uh, during the 1800s. He cared for over 10,000 24 orphans during his lifetime. He provided educational opportunities for the orphans to the point that he was even accused by some of raising the poor above their natural station. He established 117 schools which offered Christian education to more than 120,000. But here's the story. The children, we're told, are dressed and ready for school. And this is a story that was played out over and over and over again in the ministry of George Mueller. The children are dressed and ready for school, but there's no food for them to eat. 
the house mother of the orphanage, informed George Mueller. George asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. He thanked God for the food and waited. <laughs> George knew God would provide food for the children as he always did. Within minutes, a baker knocked at the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon, there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. He asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk. It was just enough for 300 thirsty children. George Mueller never had to ask or beg except the Lord to meet the needs of the orphans. That's the walk of faith. He knew he trusted the Lord. The apostles should have known. They should have trusted. They'd seen the miracles that God had used them to do miracles. And yet, because of the hardness of their heart, they miss out on this particular miracle. They miss out, at the very least, on the blessing of it. You know, it's hard to, to, to get the blessing of the miracle when you're passing out bread and fish and you're grumbling about it when you're doing it, right? Hard to grab the, the blessing in that state of mind. I know, I've been there. <laughs> Look at verse 38. But he, that's Jesus, said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. You know, so often the Lord will use the natural to perform the supernatural. He will use what we have and what we already have available and demonstrate that whatever we have becomes all that's needed in the Lord's hands. Amen? Amen. Whatever we have becomes all that's needed in the hands of the Lord. The apostles went to the crowd and all they found was five small loaves and two fish. This was a boy's lunch. These were little loaves and little fish. Not enough to feed grown men, let alone 5,000 of them, plus women and children. Look now at verses 39 and 40. Then he, that's Jesus, commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass, so they sat down in ranks, in hundreds, and, and in fifties. You know, our God is a God of order and design. So this feeding was not going to be a, a mob fighting to get what little food there was, but a sit-down meal where everyone got served and everyone got fed in order. We're also reminded here of the 23rd Psalm where it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. So he makes them sit down in, in the grass, in the green pasture. Isn't that great? Uh, here's the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. What, what a, a picture of the 23rd Psalm here. Maybe the 23rd Psalm is actually prophetic looking forward to this event. Look now at verses 41 and 42. And when he, Jesus, had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed, and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all, so they all ate and were filled. They gave what they had to Jesus. He blessed the food. And then he, he broke the loaves and continued to break the loaves and to pass them on. Could you imagine? He's, he's, he's got a loaf and he, he breaks it and he hands a piece to you. He breaks again and hands a piece to you. Okay, that's two halves. He breaks it again and he hands a piece. And so it continues. <laughs> and he keeps handing them out. And then the disciples distributed them to the people. It was a miracle. It was a miracle, and the same was done with the fish. 
You know, we need to turn over what we have to the Lord, whether little or a lot, and trust that He will make it sufficient, that He will multiply. Whatever we uh, put in the Lord's hands, the Lord can make it whatever we need it to be. Amen? But we need to put what we have, commit that to the Lord, and He'll take care of it. We also read here, so they ate and were filled. This word filled means that they were glutted. They were stuffed. It doesn't mean that they had a little bit to eat, but that they were gorged on this food. And this was like the feeling you have on Thanksgiving when you've sat down, you've eaten the turkey, the stuffing, the sweet potatoes, the mashed potatoes, the green beans, and why anybody makes green beans after all that, I don't know. <laughs> to add color to the meal, right? <laughs> and then you chase that down with pumpkin pie, right? I mean, that, and, and then, you, then you go sit on the couch. If you're as old as me, in two minutes you're asleep. <laughs> That's the feeling that these people had. They were gorged. They were clotted with food. I like the fact that Jesus just doesn't supply a little, but he supplies all we need in abundance. In verses 43 and 44, it says, And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now, a couple of things to notice here. Number one, Jesus didn't leave any trash behind. They cleaned up after themselves. I like that about the Lord. The Lord, the Lord took care of that. And notice also the Lord didn't waste anything. Number two, there were 12 apostles, weren't there? And there were 12 baskets of fragments left over. No doubt Jesus wanted to make a point of this miracle to these men so each of them had a basket full of leftovers to show them this miracle. Because as we're going to see, they missed this miracle because of the hardness of their hearts, because they were grumbling and complaining because they didn't get their rest. They'd gone away for a rest. The people had interrupted them. Jesus had compassion on them on the people, and as a result, they had to serve the people and didn't get a rest. And so they missed this miracle. Jesus gives them another chance to see it. Twelve baskets. Each of you got a basket full of fragments from five loaves and two little fish. <laughs> Do you see it? They're still complaining. Now we've got to pick up the trash now. You know, <laughs> in my mind I can see it. And there were more people than just the 5,000 men. Matthew 14, 21 tells us that this was besides women and children. So 5,000 men besides women and children. This was a huge, huge miracle. In verse 45, it says immediately, there's that word, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. Now the Gospel of John tells us that after this miracle, the people wanted to come and make Jesus king, right then and there. So he immediately sends the apostles away in a boat across the Sea of Galilee, and he sends the crowd away. As we read so often in the Gospel of John, Jesus' time was not yet. It was not time yet to make him king or to present himself as king. It would have been premature to God's plan at this point. So he sends the apostles away. Look at verse 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. After a long day of ministry, Jesus retreats to take a nap. No, to the mountain to pray. You know, Prayer is so important. It really is. Uh, Jesus knew it, and he felt the need after a long day of ministry to commune with the Father while he was here on earth. How much more we need to see the need for prayer and to pray. 
Prayer meetings ought to be the most attended meeting in a church instead of the least attended meeting. Do you hear me? They ought to be the most attended meeting. You know, a fellow was walking up to the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London back in the 1800s. Uh, it was a tabernacle that the, the pastor was the uh, famous preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And there was a man sitting out front on the stoop, and he, and he got to talking to the man on the front steps and said, you know, uh, what's the secret of Metropolitan Tabernacle? Why are there so many people that come here? He said, well, I'll show you what the secret is. And he took him around the back of the church and went down, opened the door, and they went down the stairs to a, a, a room underneath the church, and he opened that door, and that room was packed with people praying before the service. That, the man said, was the secret of Metropolitan Tabernacle. And that man sitting on the stoop out front was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But Jesus saw this need for prayer. And, and you know, again, I don't want to beat anybody up about prayer, but if, if Jesus himself thought it was important to pray, you know, we need to take prayer seriously as well, personally, but also corporately. Now look at verses 47 through 50. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he, that's Jesus, was alone on the land. Then he saw them, that is the apostles, straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. So Jesus sent the apostles across the Sea of Galilee, which is about eight miles wide, they started before it got dark. They're in the middle of the sea right now. And it was now the fourth watch of the night. That's three o'clock in the morning. They had been rowing for hours, likely six or seven hours, because the wind was against them. They were straining at rowing, it says. I'll bet they were. Have you ever had to row a boat or a canoe? out on the lake when the wind kicks up and it's against you and it just wants to push you to one side of the lake or the other, it's hard work. And the Sea of Galilee, it's a unique place. It sits at uh, an elevation of 700 feet below sea level. It's the lowest natural freshwater lake on the planet. And the wind comes down from the mountains above it and by the way, if you go north of the Sea of Galilee, you will run into Mount Hermon. And many people don't know this, but there's a ski resort on Mount Hermon. I've been there. That's how high those mountains are north of the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. Can you imagine the speed and mass that the wind picks up? as it comes off of those mountains, rushes down through that valley where the, where the Sea of Galilee sits. It roars through the lake area. And this is what it was doing on this evening. Now the last time the apostles were in trouble on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus was in the boat with them. This time, he's not physically there, but we're told he saw them straining at rowing. Even from miles away, at night, Jesus could see them. How many of you know Jesus sees you? Amen. Amen? He sees the difficulties you're in. He's not blind, he's not deaf, and he's not uncaring or uninvolved. In fact, one of the names of God from the Old Testament found in Genesis chapter 16, verse 13, is you are the God who sees. You are the God who sees. Jesus doesn't have to be physically here to see you. He's God. He sees everything. Nothing escapes him. 
But are you going to ask him for help? It says here that he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. That always puzzled me. Has it ever puzzled you that Jesus would have passed them by? I think sometimes Jesus wants us to reach out in faith to him. Amen? Amen? To say, hey, Jesus, we're, we're, we're in the boat. We're having a problem. Could you give us a hand? Mm -hmm. Not, because here's how most of us are. I'm okay, Lord. I got this. Another couple hours, I'll make it to the other side, right? I got it. Jesus wants us to ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door shall be opened. Amen? Jesus wants us to ask. And I think that's why it looked as if he would pass them by, because he wanted them to reach out to him. And in fact, they did reach out to them. It says, when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and they cried out. I'm sure they cried out, Jesus, help us! <laughs> For they all saw him and they were troubled. But Jesus even knows our fears. Isn't that great that even though they didn't, they didn't maybe recognize exactly who he was, they didn't, you know, say the right words, oh, great God, walking on the sea, come and help us, right? I mean, they, they just cried out, ah! <laughs> you know, we're singing! And we think you're a ghost, you know? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, they didn't go through just the right verbiage and all. They just cried out to Jesus. And Jesus heard them. It says immediately, he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. Why did he say, do not be afraid? Because they were afraid. They were scared out of their wits. But he calmed their fears. Now, it was at this point recorded in the Gospel of Matthew that we have Peter ask Jesus if he could walk out on the water to him. Mark doesn't record this incident because we believe that Mark got his gospel from the apostle Peter. And Peter either, number one, didn't want to make a big deal about himself, or number two, he didn't want to make a big deal about his lack of faith and in sinking into the water once he started walking. <laughs> either one of those two could be true. But it's not recorded uh, here. Now look at verses 51 and 52. But, but, but you know what is, is recorded in one of the other gospel accounts is at the moment Jesus got into the boat, not only did the wind cease, but they arrived at their destination immediately. They're in the middle of the sea. Jesus gets in the boat. And immediately they arrive at their destination. And the wind ceases. Isn't that great? You can be in the worst storm of your life. But when Jesus gets in the boat with you, you will arrive at your destination. Not only will the wind cease, but you will arrive. Isn't that great to know? Look at verses 51 and 52. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed. I'll bet they were in themselves beyond measure and marvel. Boy, could they use any more adjectives there? They were greatly amazed beyond measure and marveled. Now listen to this. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Their heart was hardened. And so they didn't understand. They had come across the sea for some rest and relaxation, but the crowd interrupted that. The apostles were hard-hearted toward the people, and so because of their attitude, their bad attitude, they missed the miracle of the loaves and fish because of their attitude. The miracle happened right under their very noses. They collected 12 baskets of fragments but they lost the blessing of that miracle because of hard hearts. How many of you think that if the apostles themselves could get a little hard-hearted at times, that we can get hard-hearted at times? Amen? Amen? You think so? 
I know I can. <laughs> I know I can get an attitude at times. I mean, just like you. And, uh, and the Lord has to correct me just like he corrects you. The apostles were too busy grumbling about having to serve. And so they missed the miracle. You know, Jesus and the apostles had two different responses to the crowd. Jesus had compassion, and the apostles wanted to send them away. Don't miss what Jesus is doing because your heart is hard. You'll miss out on a lot of wonderful things. I, I always so appreciate those people who always see the hand of the Lord at work in things that most people miss, just some natural things that people normally miss. They're going, oh, did you see how God did that? God brought that person right here and put him there, and then you said this, and, and wow, it was like right for them. And you're going, yeah, yeah I guess so. <laughs> but I so appreciate those people that see that. They have that, that spiritual antenna up, and, and they're not hard-hearted. They're, they're looking and expecting to see God do great things. Look at verses 53 and 50, through 55. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through the whole region, and began, began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. So the common people are flocking to Jesus at this point in his ministry. Many are being healed. His fame is growing. But as we're going to see in the next chapter, so is opposition from the religious authorities. In verse 56 it says, Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. The story of the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years from chapter 5 who was healed after touching the hem of Jesus' garment had no doubt spread through the region. So they brought the sick and laid them in the streets where Jesus would pass by and then they begged him that, that they might just reach out and touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him by faith were made well. Their faith and Jesus was growing, and his miracles were growing. His fame was growing, and opposition was growing as well. That's a long chapter. <laughs> and we're going to end here tonight. You know, Jesus really is all we need. Be it food, you need food, Jesus can supply it. Be it protection, from the storms of life, Jesus can provide it. Be it healing from the sickness that we all experience, Jesus can supply it. He is the God who sees, and He is the God who saves. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just so, so thank You now for Your Word for your truth, for these lessons tonight, Lord, lessons on seeing your provision, your protection, and even your healing, lessons that we can take to heart, lessons that we can have our faith stretched in, that we can learn from, and that we can grow from. And I pray, Lord, that for each and every one of us, we would continue to grow in our faith, that we would trust you more and more, Especially, Lord, as we see the day of your return approaching. Help us, Lord, to look up for our redemption draws near. And we pray these things now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, once again, we want to thank you for continuing uh, to support this ministry. God bless you, each and every one of you. Thanks for coming out tonight. And we pray that... Uh, uh, you'll make it here Sunday morning for our Sunday service in Colossians. God bless.